Greetings to you all in Jesus' precious name. This afternoon, for the word, uh, let's turn our Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verse 44 to 49. We will still be in the room today, uh, so, and consider what the Lord has for us. Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 49. If you are new, uh, we are doing a sermon series from the Gospel of Luke. We are com coming to the last few verses of this wondrous gospel, which is themed about the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. So, uh, Luke 19, 10, that is the main major theme of this gospel in the purpose statement of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, uh, Luke chapter 24, verses 44 to 49, we will read responsively. Telugu lo vakya paricharya English lo onta the kavati, Telugu lo mirvakyam follow tan ki slides lo vachnalu, mukyam shalu, and lo choosi follow galrani, manu chesto nanu. But the main points will, will be there only. Uh, and please follow me as I bring the message mostly in English. So let us read responsibly. Uttar Pratyutram Gachadukunam, Lukaswat Irvinalu, Nalabe Nalg Ninchi Nalabe Tomidi. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Verse 48. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry ye in Jerusalem until ye be endured with power from on high. Shall we pray? Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for the privilege of being in your house, in your courts, to worship a great helper and God that you are and also a hope that you are. Father, we thank you that we can come and be ministered by a God who is living, a God who speaks, a God who is in the midst of his people, who knows us in and out and is longing to give to us the life that is in your word. And even through that life, you are able to equip and empower us to live our Christian lives. And so we come, worshipping you, longing to have you speak. Yes, Lord, where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. And so, Lord, we come this afternoon, unworthy, unable to do anything. And of myself, I pray that you would speak through me, to me, to each one of us this afternoon. And in the ministry of your word, our lives may be transformed to be the kind of people that you have called us to be to the highest calling of walking worthy of your name that is upon our lives. To such an end, Lord, bless our time together. And Lord, may that be profitable to our eternity. We ask for your blessing. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. We are in the resurrection account of our Lord Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 24 is all about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we can see that Luke is giving to us in three simple um, sections of scripture. The first one focusing on the tomb, verses 1 to 12, and the rest, uh, the road and the room, verses 24, verses 13 to, 15, 13 to 35, and then the room, which is from 36 to 49. When we see how our Lord Jesus Christ after being risen, is focused on wanting to work with his disciples whom he has called. He, being the risen Lord and Savior, knew 
what it is to be living in this sin-cursed, death-ruling world and having overturned death, he not only wants to now come to speak peace, as we have looked at last week, in this Lord of Peace that he is, we come to see that he comes to speak peace. This is the first words that he says as the disciples that have gathered together in a place, as he enters this room and he pronounces peace. Yes, in this sin-cursed, death-reigning world, man is devoid of peace. There are many false pieces that we can suffice ourselves with. But true peace, the peace that Jesus can give with God and with one another and the rest that we, we can find can be found no other place and no one else can give apart from the risen Lord and Savior. And so we've considered how he pronounces that peace, how he provides that peace, and actually makes us to be those who will be preachers of the peace of God. Because the God of peace is going to be with them. They become the preachers of God. Preachers of the peace that God gives to them. And so we've seen this in the Lord of peace. Apart from being the Lord of peace in the room, our Lord Jesus Christ is also the author of faith. He's given this title by the author of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. A wonderful title that he, the author of Hebrews gives. He is the author and finisher of our faith, according to KJV in James translation. He is the author and the perfecter of faith in many other translations. And uh, when we see that he is the author and perfecter of our faith, he is beginning to won wondrously, winsomely work with these disciples who are of people of little faith. Yes, they were called out from this world to follow their masters. Time and again, we see um, in various instances, they've demonstrated how little of a faith that they can have. Um, only when storms come, you and I know how our faith is. Uh, and it, is, it goes to say, ships or great ships are built for the great storms that are there. And our lives are like this ships or boats that are navigating to the turbulent times and storms of this world. And how are you and I, as a boat of faith or a ship of faith that you are, to face the storms that are to come? Yes, our Lord knows how our faith is because he is the very author of it. And not only the author, he is the enhancer of it, He's actually the finisher of it and the perfecter of it. Today, we will see how our Lord Jesus Christ winsomely works in the hearts of the disciples to encourage them and to enhance their faith, empower them to be the kind of disciples that they turn the world upside down. And we need that. And when we are in the room or in the sanctuary of God's people, wherever be the gathering of God's people, God is there to work the same thing in you and me. And we need to see how he does that. And so that we can also come and asking the Lord to, as the disciples said, increase our faith, Lord. That should be our prayer as we come. Every time we come to the word of God, we come to the presence of God, we need the Lord to build our faith. We need the Lord to take us from faith to faith, as Romans 1.17 says. You can't be stagnant. In our faith life, we are called to be those who would be prepared for greater storms that are to come in our lives. Things that you and I wouldn't even imagine. And that's the work that the Lord does. As he did so in the disciples' life, I pray that it would be the same today. As he is the same Lord risen amidst us, wanting to minister and speak to us. And so, I have titled my sermon as uh, we look at it, is the author and the perfecter of our faith. And we would see how he does this wondrous work. And in so bringing this message, I'm going to give to us a quick, a very fast browse through of a sermon that I already preached. If you were part of that in what we teach series, I have preached a sermon. You can go back and look at it. Faith, in, through faith where fruit abounds. Some of those will be repeated here. 
but they are worth, they are essential that we take and look at what biblical faith is as opposed to what people uh, might think faith is or what we might have been um, learning as in our own backgrounds of what faith could be. So bear with me as I refresh ourselves with those slides. So the first thing that he does after he proves him to proves himself to be the Lord of peace, starting from verse 44 and verse 46, we see, and he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Not only he says, he points them to the scripture. He says, the law of Moses, prophets, Psalms, that's all the Old Testament that was the scriptures for them. And the disciples had the scripture with them. These Jewish, uh, yes, they were fishermen, but every Jewish boy or every Jewish person is brought up with a lot of scripture. They knew the scripture a lot. They were to buy heart the scripture. They were to treasure the scripture. And they were to recite the scripture. They were to have the scripture all over their houses. So much so that they were scripture saturated. And so Jesus was pointing them back to the scripture that they had. And not only he's pointing them, but he's explaining them. Come with me to verse 46. And he says, and he said unto them, thus it was written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. The first thing that we need to note about faith is that faith is founded on the scripture. Faith is not founded on miracles as we have this modern Christianity assume that you and I get faith when we see some miracle happen before us. Even if miracle happens, you would never get biblical faith. Biblical faith is founded on scripture. And that I can and we can clearly see as we see the very definition of faith. Come with me to the Hebrew, uh, the letter that uh, the author of Hebrews wrote into Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. We find that it is essential we need to get the scriptural teaching to understand what faith is. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Sorry, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 gives us the very definition of faith. This is Bible's definition of faith. And many a times, faith is also misunderstood in this way. Faith is understood as, as, especially Christian faith. You blindly believe whatever somebody said. Sadly, that's not true of biblical faith. Faith is not blind. In fact, faith is not blindly believing what somebody said. But faith has two components. As Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, it has the component of substance. It has the component of evidence. Faith, as Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 gives to us, is that now faith is the substance of the things hoped for and the evidence of the things not seen. It's not blind. It is evidence-oriented. Now, you might ask me, what is the substance? What is the evidence? I have talked about this multiple times in various settings, whether it be Bible study or other places, but simply the substance is the very word of God. You and I can hold the substance. You and I have the word of God. And faith essentially is based on God's word. And that's why faith comes by hearing. Hearing what? Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. When you and I hear God's word, that is when faith comes into our hearts and lives. It's not by seeing. Faith is by hearing and hearing the very word of God. And so the substance for faith to be received is the very word of God. Not only the substance, it also has evidence. Now you and I might ask, what is the evidence? And that is, when you and I take God's word, God's word is going to become the lens. We understand telescope is designed as a lens to see things that are far off, that we and I can't see with our naked eye. Somebody says there is Jupiter, somebody says there is Neptune, there is Pluto. Have you and I seen it? No. But can you and I see it? Yes. When? When we use the telescope that all these so-called astronomers use and try to see and gaze and see that there is a planet like that. So is it with the Bible, 
when we come to see through the lens of the scripture, you and I see things that you and I would not see with our naked eye. See things which were in the past. Go back to the scripture and see the history of the scripture, history given in the scripture and history of mankind. You would see so parallel. And you and I can see, yes, the Bible is true. Come with me to the things that are in present. The scripture shows things that are deep inside your heart and mine. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all and, and desperately wicked. No one in this world gives that description apart from the Bible, which gives the true reality of the deep things of our heart. Not only the things of our heart, things that are seen all around this world. Why is the world the way the way it is? How evil it is, how world is rampant, plagued with sin, disease, destruction, and death. Because the Bible can give you the answer. As you see through the scriptural lens, you and I see the answers of how the Bible shows the way the world has become in the fall that has come. Yes, through the lens of the scripture, you don't get to see not only the past, but the present, but also the future in the prophecies that it gives, how Jesus is going to come as the reigning king and how there is judgment that is coming forth and the day of the Lord and the things that are to come as the book of Revelation gives to us. So the scripture is the lens which gives us the evidence as you and I want to see the evidence of God, see through the lens of the scripture that gives you the faith that is biblical. So we come to see as scriptural teaching, Jesus is helping them. Have you not seen the law of Moses? Have you not seen what the prophets have written? Have you not seen what the Psalms have said about me? That is what have, be, have come to fulfill. It beho behooved or it was necessary for Christ to suffer first and to rise again before he is the reigning king. And you know what happens when we come to the scripture? There are things that are believable and we love to believe them. Or oh, the promises that say, God is going to hear all your prayers. He's going to, he's nigh unto you. He's there beside you, God with us. We love those promises and we love to believe them. And we like, when, when the Bible says, God is the one who creates the storms in your life. God is the one who will allow you to go through affliction. Things that are difficult to believe, you and I would say, okay, that's for a later time and park it somewhere. Because it's not easy to believe. So we choose, we are selectively picking what we need to believe. And that's not biblical faith. Biblical faith is to come to the scripture as it is and let God give deep convictions of what the word of God says to be the conviction of our heart. That no matter what, you and I can say, just like how Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away. Matthew 24, verse 35, Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but not my word. And that is what biblical faith is founded on God's word. And so faith is the root. And so come with me to the Christian definition of faith. How is it? This is from what we teach series. You can go back there. I'll be very quick in brushing us up. What makes someone a Christian? Any human being in this world, there are two paths that are there to come to God in, in general, in general. And the first one that people, we all are aware of in many faith systems pursue of is the good works path. You and I want to do something and come reach attain that state where we can be in connection or relationship with God. And all the faith systems, apart from the biblical faith, is founded on this works-based salvation. And so, biblical faith is not based on good works. Bible, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, we know it is not of works. Salvation, you and I are saved by grace through faith, and it's not of works, lest any man should boast. A Christian salvation and faith is based not on works, but on by the grace of God and through the faith. And so when we look at what biblical faith is, we find in, uh, come with me to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. There's a very good, interesting conversation that happens between our Lord 
and the, and the Jewish people that were there. John chapter 6, verse 28. Notice the question that is asked by these Jewish people. The Jewish people ask this question and say, John chapter 6, verse 28. Yohan Swartaru Irvayamdlo, Yuda Mata Pravistulu, Pariseilu, Sastrulu Viru, Adutuna Prashna and Gamaninchandi. What does the question go to say? Then said they unto them, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Take note in the assumption that they can do some work and let God, let God approve that so that they can become godly or they can become people who have received salvation. That's the presumption. Because we live in this performance-based world, world, and so we presume we can do something somehow and perform and gain the approval of God, gain the righteousness of God or salvation of God. But the truth is, Jesus then answers in verse 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God that ye might believe on him whom he has sent. There's no work that you need to do. If you, are, if you are seeking after works, that is not the biblical faith or biblical way of salvation. It is to believe. It is to receive this faith. And then he goes on to say, they want some sign to believe then. Verse 30. Again, as I said, biblical faith is not on seeing, not on miracles that they see. They wanted a sign. And Jesus says, there is no sign that will be given apart from the one who is sent. And so, long story short, what we come to see is that biblical faith is, is founded on done. And the religions of this world is founded on do. What can I do is a question that comes up. But biblical faith says, or Christian faith says, it is done. Can you believe what God did? And that's where the major difference is. Now, I, I kind of gave some slides uh, as we come to slide three. You would find that uh, God is giving to us. God is giving to us. That's good, brother. Thank you. So God is giving to us this definition of biblical faith where faith is the root. It is the foundation of our salvation. And works is a fruit. Works is not the root. In all the world religions that are there, Works are the root, and they think they can gain salvation. But it is this thing called faith which is the root. And so we see, when we come to imagine works to be the root, it comes as, as the Roman Catholicism gives to us, the plus religion. It's not alone. It is not faith alone. It is not by grace alone. It is not for the glory of God alone. It is not by Christ alone. It is not in scripture alone. But it is plus something. Some work has to be done that they will be satisfied that I earned my salvation. Isn't that true of all the faith systems that are there? But sadly, biblical faith is alone. In faith alone, through faith, these five solas of reformation that you and I have looked at in what we teach series, through faith alone, sola fide, reformation, uh, where we have recovered the gospel. And Christianity says, it is all done. Can you believe what God did? And when you trust what God has given in his son, you and I receive this faith and salvation. And so we come to see that by grace alone, in Christ alone, in scripture alone, by the glory of God alone, you and I are saved. And Christian faith, biblical faith, is, is founded on faith being the root. And so we saw this definition of faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, we saw the definition of faith. Faith's definition and faith's reception. How is it that you and I receive that faith? Romans chapter 10, verse 17, we saw that it is hearing of God's word. Not only that, we also saw that faith brings justification. Turn with me to Romans 3, verse 22. It is through faith that you and I are justified, not of works. Romans 3, verse 22. Let me read that. Romil Krabina Patrika, Moodi Ravirundlo. Viswasan Dwara Manamu, Neet Mantulga, Teach the Bartunamu, Ani, Mana Kriel Valna Kadu, Ani, 
వాక్యపు సంబంధించిన విశ్వాసం ద్వారా రక్షణ గురించిన మాట మనకి కనపడుతుంది ప్లస్ ట్వంటీ టూ ఇట్ సేస్ ఈవెన్ ద రైచియస్నెస్ ఆఫ్ గాడ్ విచ్ ఈస్ బై ఫెయిత్ ఆఫ్ జీసస్ క్రైస్ట్ ఆన్ టు ఆల్ అండ్ అపాన్ ఆల్ దెమ్ దట్ బిలీవ్ ఫర్ దెర్ ఇస్ నో డిఫరెన్స్ no matter what your background is god has made provision for you and i to be made right righteousness is being made right with god you can never be right in your own efforts only through the work that was done in jesus christ that you can be made right righteousness of god can be conferred to you and that is biblical faith it brings us to receive justification and it makes us to be in possession of this biblical faith and it manifests itself in the fruit of the spirit of god and that we would walk by faith and not by sight turn with me to second corinthians chapter 5 verse 7 rendu korinthi rendu adhyayam aidho adhyayam edho vachanam lo we walk not by sight but by faith we begin to walk according to the word of god faith as as a root it's going to bring in us the fruit of of so many aspects that again if i go into the talking about the five flavors of five kinds of fruit i'll just list to us the five kinds of fruits that we receive and that is we we come to receive the fruit of repentance that's the first fruit that faith is going to produce and my humble uh prayer is that none of us in this room would have some faith where there was no repentance that's not biblical faith and that it would first lead you to see that there is a desperate need for you and i to repent of our sin is not something about just believing that jesus died for the sins of the whole world and a general belief about who jesus is that's not going to save you and i it ought to produce in us a deep sorrow and a godly sorrow that you and i would be sorrowing for the sin that crushed our savior on the cross of calvary have you and i ever had such a deep godly sorrow if not your faith is just a kind of some figment of imagination that i have believed jesus christ that's not going to bring any change it has to begin with the fruit of repentance otherwise there is no fruit had that fruit been real otherwise your salvation is a fake salvation it's not going to lead you to the true being right made right with god and so this fruit of repentance is going to cause in you a hunger to have the fruit of righteousness you and i want to live right with god because you have been made right and so we long to have the fruit of righteousness then comes the fruit of our lips you and i would be glad to open up in our worship time to say god i thank you for this salvation how could i be saved why me lord and you and i would have this fruit of thanksgiving pro- produced as a result of this biblical faith not only so a fruit of the spirit if there's a beginning of nine fold flavors of the fruit of the spirit love joy peace goodness gentleness meekness self control those are all going to become more and more of a reality as we grow in faith and finally the fruit of labor you and i begin to labor for the lord who gave this great salvation and so these are the these are the aspects of biblical faith which is very different and god is giving to us in this resurrection account in the room of how jesus is winsomely working this in the hearts and lives of the disciples so we are back again to luke chapter 24 where jesus explains the scripture to produce in them this biblical faith yes they had little faith they believed that jesus is the messiah they believed that he was their hope he was their everything and soon all as though all that hope got shattered he was killed he was crushed on calvary and now there is a sprouting up of new kind of hope as they see him alive conquering death they had to see because they're going to write 
and they're going to become the martyrs that they will be for turning the world upside down. Now, faith, as we see, it comes by ex explaining to them and explaining to us how the scripture gives to us the understanding of faith. So as we come, we see there are five things that Jesus does. Come with me to John, sorry, Luke chapter 24. First, he explains them and that he does so by scriptural teaching. Then he enlightens them in verse 45, Luke chapter 24, verse 45. He is explaining to them and then he is enlightening them. Verse 45 says, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Have it, has it been to you that uh, sometimes you and I read through the same chapter and you're like, where did, how could I miss that word? How did I not read that before? And that's called enlightening. Many a times in this world, enlightenment is said, self-realization it seems that you are God. That is the worldly way of enlightenment. You see God in yourself. That is the worldly way of enlightenment. Sorry that there is no God in yourself. You're not God. That's not what Bible says. That's not what God had meant. You and I are created. Creator, creation, not creator. God is different from you and I totally. True enlightenment is when God casts light on the scripture and we see with a fresh eyes and see, how did I miss that? Because there is a fresh enlightenment. And yes, Jesus did that. As he cast a, a bright light in the Old Testament prophecies, they saw the scripture afresh like never before. And the spirit of God does that to us, to us also these days. Is the scripture's enlightenment that makes us to trust the scripture more. Come with me as how the scripture enlightenment was done. He opened their understanding that they might understand scripture. You and I might wonder how he did that. I just imagine, I was prayerfully considering what might have he opened to them. At least he might have opened to them Psalm 22. Come with me to Psalm 22 where we see how he points them, this must happen for Messiah. And they might have read Psalm 22 n number of times before, but have never seen all this. As you and I would see, Psalm 22 verse 1, what was Jesus saying on the cross of Calvary? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yes, they thought it was only David who said that. But it is what Christ would say it as messianic psalm, Psalm 22. And not only in Psalm 22, verse 1, but Psalm 22, verse 16, we read the second part. And they pierced my hands and my feet. Probably Jesus would have so shown them this psalm. Isn't this true of what has happened to me on the cross of Calvary? Yes, they believed that. And you know what? As soon as he shared that, they were like, how did I miss this? Not only that, he then moved uh, further on in Psalm 22, verse 22. He says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Now as a risen savior, they were able to worship him, glorify him, that he is risen. As he is sharing, as he is declaring that with his brethren, he's told to them, you are my brothers. I'm going to my father. They come to understand the scripture afresh like never before. And he's saying, I will declare to them, these are the brethren, these are the disciples. And not only that, in verse 27, and all the ends of the world shall remember and turn on to the Lord and all the kindreds of the nation shall worship before thee. Isn't that what he's saying? Come with me back to Luke chapter 23. He says in verse 47, and that repentance and the remission of sins should be preached to his, in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. See, he's enlightening the scriptures. As scripture is opened up and as the light is cast bright, you and I see the truthfulness of scripture and that becomes a conviction of our heart. Yes, scripture is true. 
and you'll go back from this room and I will go back from this room with that deep conviction that the word of God will come to pass. And that's the conviction a Christian should be living in this world. Not by thinking that I'll have faith when I see a miracle. When you and I know the scripture is trustworthy and that you will trust your life, my personal thought life, your personal thought life, your personal private life, when nobody is there, would you be able to trust the scripture and say, I will let the scriptural principles guide me when I am all alone. Not my wish, my favorite things guide me. When you and I have that deep conviction that you are the same, trusting the scripture when you are all alone, and that deep conviction is true, deep in your being, that's when true enlightenment happens. Not in the conviction that you are God. Sadly, that's not true. And so, moving forward, that's when we get the scriptural understanding and we are truly enlightened by the Spirit of God. He does that today as well. As we read the scripture, the Spirit of God is going to convict you of any sin that is there. Because he's not going to, he's not going to be, it's not going to be pleasant for him. He's a holy God. He's a holy spirit. And he has to indwell you, forbear you patiently, day in and day out. He's not going to depart from you, but he's going to be grieved. And he's going to cause you and I to be convicted of our sin. And so that we can repent and have the conviction of the word of God. Now, that comes not only a Lord Jesus, he explains them, he enlightens them, he encourages them. This is what is so beautiful of Christian life. Our Lord knows that we are weak beings. He knows how we need encouragement. Not only to be pounded of all our failures. Yes, the Spirit of God is so gentle and winsome. And not only that, he encourages us. How does he encourage us? Come with me to verse 47. He says, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. He encourages them by saying that the scripture should be fulfilled. What was the scripture I, told, I showed to us in Psalm 22, verse 22, that nations should be knowing of all the salvation plan that God has in store through Jesus Christ. And as that scripture fulfillment is being shown to them, they are encouraged. Yes, it is a fulfillment of the scripture. We have the very word of God. We have the true Messiah. We have the true message of salvation to the whole world, to me. And I'm encouraged. You are encouraged. We have the treasure that the world needs. The world doesn't have the problem of riches. Many a times, the many world problem solvers, they say, the problem of the world is poverty. Sadly, if poverty is the problem, there are enough rich people to solve the problem. Sadly, the problem of the world is not poverty. The problem of the world is not illiteracy. There are many great teachers. If that was so, Jesus would have been a great teacher. He would have solved the world's problem. The, sol the problem of the world to the Bible's definition is depravity. Depravity where man desperately needs to be rescued from sin, Satan, self, and the system of this world so that they can have salvation. And he solved it by defeating sin, Satan, self, system of this world, and conquering that and giving that message of triumph and victory to you and to me. Now, you and I have that message and the world has the problem. Now, what is the problem? The problem is that you and I only have the message, the world doesn't have it. You and I need to take that message. You and I need to believe that to the core of it and to proclaim it to the loudest shouting of possible so that people would hear and come to receive that same message of salvation. And isn't that encouraging? That you and I have that treasure that the world desperately needs. If somebody had a full cure for COVID-19 and had it in their home, in their, in their treasure and is not sharing it, that's the worst kind of person to live, right? And may that not be of us. At least 
if you and I are encouraged that you and I have the world's solution and that we can go out and live and share, that's a great encouragement. Now, not only that, he is revealing that plan. There's a plan that Jesus has to proclaim this message of repentance, salvation to all our friends, our neighbors, our relatives, everyone. And he encourages them by telling that plan. You and I are part of that plan in whatever way possible. Yes, I'm, and we'll come to it. I know sometimes the moment we talk about evangelism or plan, oh, I'm very fearful, I'm terrified. Those are the things that come to us. Oh, what will they think? They'll think I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm someone who has become a preacher now. Oh, this man, this girl, this woman has become a preacher now. He, she, she's preaching me. Whatever they might think, and whatever you might think about yourself and mine, there is encouragement. I'm going to tell you because God is not someone or Jesus is not someone who calls the equipped. He's not calling someone who are already talented to do it. He's not calling orators. He's not calling those who are gifted speakers to do this. He's calling ordinary people and he is going to equip them. He is going to empower them to do that. And that's encouragement. You and I don't need to think, oh, I'm not qualified, I'm not equipped, I'm not able. No. If only you and I are willing, then there is a great empowerment, equipping that comes. Come with me to the next uh, portion. Apart from, as an author of faith, in verse 48, he's beginning to employ them. Many times in this world, we, we're filled with this recession fears in this world. People are scared will, they'll lose their jobs. And uh, in the midst of all that, the employers are like, even if they have to take you into a new job, they're going to strain you completely, distill you, thoroughly filter you and say, until you pass through six levels of interviews, you cannot get this job. That's how this world is. But the, but the only prerequisite for you and I to be employed by Jesus Christ is a willing heart. A willing heart and availability, not ability. The moment you and I say that I am here, Lord, I'm here, I I'm available to you. Oh, come on in. You are employed. That's what the disciples had to do. Are you and I going to do that today? And say, I'm here, Lord. Will you take me? Even me, Lord, I'm not so great a speaker. I don't know how to share the gospel. I don't even know the whole Bible. I don't know how I'll answer somebody ask a question about Christian faith. I might be totally blanked. And I'll probably make you look so horrible before them. No, you don't have to be worried about what people will think about Christ or about you. You just need to say, I'm willing, Lord. And the moment you and I are saying, I'm willing, Lord, what Jesus did is, in verse 47, he says, and ye are my witnesses for these. These are ordinary fishermen. They had no biblical training, no seminary, not even a training how to preach, how to be a leader, no leadership workshop, nothing. There they are, they just have to say, yes, here we are, Lord. Here am I, leaving all the fishing nets. Peter, John, James, they come follow, trusting all their hope in. And that's encouragement. Not only encouragement, he employs them. Ye are my witnesses. Twelve were enough to turn the world upside down. Two thousand years has passed by. The gospel still thrives. It thrives on the power that they have received. As he comes to verse 49, we read, and that's why the empowerment is also from him, not in you, in me. Before that, he says, there is a scriptural purpose. You should be witnesses. There's a purpose for why you and I are still living on this earth. If you and I are living just for your family, just for your jobs, just for some kind of a, of a plan to get something in this world, 
Jesus could do in many other ways. Your family will be taken care. He feeds very well, much more than how we can feed our family. He takes good care. He's not a debtor to the orphans or widows. He takes care of them much more wonderfully. He's their heavenly father. He's their provider. God takes care of them. But the true reality of why you and I are still living is that you and I be his witnesses. That is the purpose. He gives them that scriptural purpose. And apart from them, he says, I'm going to empower you. Don't rush to be a witness until you are empowered. And that empowering is there even today. Come with me to verse 49. He says, and behold, I send the promise of my father upon you. But tarry ye in Jerusalem until ye be endured with power on high. He is the one who is going to equip them. He is the one who is going to equip us and empower us. What empowering? Ten days after his ascension. We're going to look at the ascension, God willing, next Sunday. As he promised, there was such empowerment that these same disciples, no qualifications at all. Those that were qualified, those that were in authority and power, they were baffled by the boldness that they had. Come with me to Acts chapter 4. Acts, chap Acts chapter 4. The Sanhedrin was investigating John and Peter. They were trying to see what is it that makes them to have this authority? What is it that gives them this boldness? In Acts chapter 4, verse 13, this is the words. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, this is their statement. Boldly, with great conviction, this is what they have said you, uh, unilaterally. Sweeping statement that they say. Salvation is found in no other name except in the name of Jesus Christ. They've not been to India. They've not been to any other place outside Jerusalem and Judea. But they knew how true the word of God is. So much so they say, salvation is found in no other name. That's conviction, my dear brother and sister. Have you and I that conviction that the scripture is true? Even whether heaven and earth will pass away, no matter what, the scripture is true. And that's the word of God. That is foundation for your and my faith. If that is true, then you and I would say and declare like these unqualified fishermen. And the only qualification that they have is what, what we see in verse 13. That is what the, the authorities and Sanhedrin have realized. Now in verse 13, we read, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. You know, God would want to marvel others. Are you ready? Are you and I say, are going to say yes? Are you saying, I'm available, Lord, to use me to marvel others, to get glory to your name and not me? These are ignorant fishermen. There are, these are unlearned fishermen. And they marvel, what did they took knowledge of? They took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Be with him, he's going to empower you. The very time where you come in prayer, solitary, as a family, as a church, there is empowerment. In the time that you spend with him, the spirit of God is going to empower you. He's going to fill you with the word of God so that when you open the mouth, it's the word of God that comes with deep conviction. Today, the Christendom desperately need Christians who have the word of God as conviction. Word of God is there with you in our hand. Word of God is there with us in our mind as we memorize. But is it there deep in our heart as deep conviction so that no matter who is there, whether it be the PM or the president or anyone, when the conviction is deep, you don't have to care who is standing on the other side. You would stand boldly and say, this is true. That's what Martin Luther had done. He said, unless my conscience proves me guilty or unless you can prove through the scripture, here I stand. He stood before great, and great authority of the Roman Catholic Church. But he said, here I stand, God help me. That's what your prayer and my prayer would be with humbleness, but with boldness. 
you and I would stand before people, our friends, and anyone, whomever you and I are to stand before and present the gospel. There's gospel fest coming. And the simplest thing you can and I can do is those that you and I have been praying for, neighbors, friends, just invite them to allow them to be exposed to the gospel. Gospel has the power, not you and me. Gospel has the power to save. That's the solution for the world. And we have it. And the author of our faith has given it to us. Not only that we believe, not only we see that work in our lives, but you know, he perfects our faith. He's not only the author of our faith, but he's the finisher or perfecter of our faith. You know, when you and I would have a perfecting of faith or enhancing of faith, when you and I stand for God's word, when you and I come to the other side to represent, be the witnesses for God and say, this is God's word, you and I are more strengthened in faith than anyone else. And so that's the portion that you and I are used by God to have God's word work in others. When that happens, when you see that, your faith is taken to a next level. God's word working in you is going to enhance your faith. God's word working in others as he uses even you, unqualified. But the mere qualification is God called you. Unequipped, but because God equipped you. Not powerful, but because God has empowered you. God uses to see God's word work in others. That's going to take you from faith to faith. So much so that Jesus becomes the author and the perfecter of our faith. He became so the, the day when he rose again to the very disciples, as he stood be, between them, in the midst of them, working in their life winsomely with the word of God and building in them a biblical faith that they were able to be used to turn the world upside down. And today too, he's here. Every Sunday too, he's there to strengthen us, to let the roots of our faith grow deep in God's word. So much so, the fruit of the spirit of God flavors out of us. So much so that the empowering of the spirit of God is going to make us to be used as mighty vessels for his glory. And so to such an end, may he be the author and the finisher of your faith and my faith as well. Would you let that be so? Would you and I let that be so? Let's ask the Lord for his blessing upon this word, shall we? Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for enabling us to come together this Lord's day to come and to consider your precious word. Yes, Lord, you are the Lord of peace who stood amidst them on the first day where you rose again, conquered the grave. And you are alive even today. The same Lord of peace is the very author of faith and the perfecter of faith. O oh Lord, we praise you, worship you for thy precious word through which you give us this gift of faith. Not only you are the author of our faith, you're the one who enhances us, our faith by enabling us to see thy word come alive, to be made real for ourselves and for those that are around us. So that your word would become deep convictions to all of our hearts. That we would be emboldened by that conviction. To stand for your word. No matter what the storms. That we would stand boldly. Proclaiming your word. That we would be empowered. To see your word work not only in us. But in many others. To such an end Lord. May you be the author. And the perfecter of my faith and our faith. Thank and praise you. For being such a God who encourages us, who knows us, who equips us, who empowers us. Thanking and praising you. For we ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.